especially you'll see these in an IDE context. A quick fix is some trivial fix to, to an identified problem. Something like um, you have an unused variable, you add an underscore to it. You know, it's a trivial thing, it just does what needs to be done. Then you get an assist, which is something that'll show up in the ID because it has decided it can help you in some way. There's no, not necessary guarantees to it. It'll be like if you want to, you've selected this body of text, you can extract it into a function. Um, not all of those are guarantees, but they do kind of help you move your code along. And then a refactor is a change to the code that preserves the semantics. And that's the kind of key part to it. In other words, you should be able to do a refactor without having a man in the loop. Um, so it's safe to do offline. Um, so long as the code compiles cleanly in the, it initially, um, you, can, you should be able to do a, a, a refactor. Um, another word for a refactor is a code mod, which is, what, is the kind of term we use when you're doing them in this offline mode. Um, and when you write a refactor or a uh, code mod, there are three concerns. Um, not always what you think about, input. Um, input, when you are wanting to change code, you have to do it in a context. You have to know which files are included, what are the compile options, what dependencies have been used, um, you know, how, how is it put together, what build system was used. Um, you know, there's, there's a whole lot of bits and pieces that make just having a known context for your compile, you know, don't forget a refactor has to work with um, code that compiles cleanly, just to get it so that you are compiling the code that you think you are, so that you can make changes to it, is fairly challenging. Second problem is to actually do the refactor processing. Um, we'll come back to that a bit later. But it doesn't matter how good your processing, your, your, you, know, you can have the right files, you can generate a beautiful refactor, but if you can't do anything with that, it's also useless. So the last important step is output. Um, and the kind of the normal use, the two main driving use cases, the one is in your IDE, you're busy changing your code, you've, you see you can do a refactor, you push the button, it does it, and you save your code and you carry on. Or if you are trying to improve the quality of your code base, you've decided that a certain function should no longer be used and you want to get rid of it throughout the code base, but you want to do it in a safe and clean way, then you'll use it as a, uh, oops, what's happened here? then you'll use it as a, um, as a code mod. Um, there are other ways that you could integrate as well. Today, we, at lunch, we were talking about um, possibly integrating into the shell. Um, you have these notebook environments. You know, there's a lot of other places that it can happen. Um, so it's not just about, here is my refactor and make it work. You've got to make sure that it's actually used somewhere. So the thing I'm talking about today is the Erlang language platform. Um, it's a code intelligence platform for Erlang. Um, my team and me and my team have been working on this for a couple of years at WhatsApp. Um, it's Roberto Alloy and Michal Mascala will be talking about it after lunch tomorrow as as its IDE and its history and how it works inside and you know, all those those beautiful details. Um, today I'm just going to be talking about using it for writing diagnostics which have got fixes and that you can use as code mods, emphasizing the kind of code intelligence aspects of it. Um, so what does it bring? Uh, it, it first, the first thing it does is it solves the input and the output problems that we mentioned before. Um, it can load an Erlang project, process all the files and dependencies. Um, it generates an internal database of, of what it's seen. Um, and this database allows you to work at, a, at the equivalent of abstract forms, but um, with macros expanded, but you can also traverse this, this representation at the pre-expanded level. So the analysis happens with full expansion, but when, you, when you're working with the code to do your changes, you obviously want to make a change at the surface level. You don't want to make a change deep in some macro in some include file. Um, so the changes happen at the surface level. A macro shows up as a function call. Um, you can then deal with it as you like. Um, so by having access to this information, you can write your, your actual changes. Um, these are normally represented as a diagnostic, so it shows up either in the IDE or in your command line output, and the command line output can show up in a lint tool, in your CI, on the command line, what, what, yeah, however you like. 
and then it has these fixes associated with it, and you can then apply the fix um, to update the code. And you know, we'll see some examples shortly. This, this update process can happen either in your IDE live as you're editing, or um, when you um, call it from the command line. So here we have a video of an attribute that's been spelled wrong. It's got two fixes. One fix is to ignore it, and the other is to, uh, is to correct the spelling. Um, in the video, we're going to see them both applied. Um, this is just to kind of give you an idea of, of what the IDE experience is like. So there, first of all, just pointing out that error code. We'll talk about that shortly. So there are two fixes. The one is to ignore the problem. This is something built into the Erlang language platform. You can ignore things so you reduce the noise, or you can actually apply the fix and change it. Now, <clears throat> you'll have seen in the, in the bottom there, it shows up as that W0013. That's an error code. Um, we have introduced the concept of the Erlang error index. Um, similar to what other languages have done, um, Rust has got it, Haskell has got it. Um, it's a way of, this is, this is what our page looks like. Um, it's part of the project, it's fully open source. Um, we're hoping to get some community take up on it. The, the kind of numbering scheme and all the rest of it is up for discussion. This is just what we have at the moment. Um, it is using the same numbering scheme that is already in Erlang LS because we introduced it there first. Um, so essentially for every error that shows up, it shows up with an error code, you have a link to it, you can come to the page, it explains the things that you can do to sort it out. The really interesting part about it is that once these error codes become kind of a way of talking about specific problems, then you can search for them. So you know, you search, I've got this problem, and it'll show up in Stack Overflow or Reddit or wherever people are talking about that problem, it's going to be indexed by this error code. So it it's kind of has a, a secondary effect. You know, first you have it, and you have a description of it, and the description is nice and all, but it gives you a kind of a way of looking for, for ways of solving that problem. Um, this is how the same problem that we saw before gets applied um, from the command line. It's a bit complicated. We're calling ELP lint. We're saying we're building a rebar project. Um, we're filtering out the W0013 as that we saw before in that particular module. We're applying the fix, and you can see it says this is what we found, the misspelled attribute, and this is, this is the diff that we've generated and applied to it. It has actually modified the code in place at this point, so you can just use your normal um, tools to generate a pull request. And you know, this is limited to a particular module. It could run across your entire project. Wherever it shows up, it's going to do the, uh, it's going to do the fix. Um, that's not all. The lint engine has we, in, in order to make the writing of, a, of a, a change as simple as possible, we make it that you kind of define the simplest thing for your change, and then we have a simplification pass that runs through. Um, so we have these simplification rules like, if you want to get rid of a, a, a function that normally returns OK at the end of it if it's done OK, then you replace it with OK, and then let this thing clean up the mess afterwards. And sometimes you need that OK there as a constant. Other times, it's just dead code and can be removed. Um, so here, the, the effect free statement is the one I've just described. So here you can see when it starts up. So there we've got that app B application env error. If you look really closely, you'll see there's like three little dots under it. That's because we've got this like custom diagnostic that we've created for it. We want to remove it. It normally returns an OK atom. Um, in this context, the OK atom doesn't, doesn't matter. So when we do it, you'll see it shows up. We replace the call with OK. There we get the OK. We get another thing to remove the redundant um, usage, and it's gone. Now. What's interesting is if you apply this from the command line, you only specify the first one, and the rest is a cleanup, and it's just going to get automatically applied, but only to the changes that you've read that, that your first fix made. So it doesn't go through the whole code and look for anything that's changed. It just says, you've changed this, but can we clean it up and cleans it up if, if it can. Um, we've got some other cleanup steps. Um, I'll show you a kind of grab bag of them in the next example. Um, a redundant assignment and a trivial match. So in this video, 
This is a, this is a kind of a classic problem. You have a test setup. Um, you've decided that this app -E test setup is no longer needed. You've refactored the way your test cases work. But that config is still being chased through. You need to use it everywhere else in your code. So you specify that you're going to replace the call to app -E test setup with just the second parameter, the config you passed in. You're going to just return that as the, uh, as the config that you got. So you're going to see it'll return that as its initial value and then just clean up as it goes. So we first replace the call. We get config 0 equals config. We use the assignment everywhere. So we just say, OK, it's config everywhere. And that match is not doing anything. So now we've got a redundant a, a use, a redundant statement. And the whole thing's done. So because you're not sure what your context is going to be when you write your refactor, you don't worry about that. You let these cleanup phases come out, come behind, and pick it up for you. Um, which makes it a lot simpler to write a refactor. You can focus on just the one thing it must do and not worry about all this other stuff. Um, the whole point of this platform is to make you not have to worry about all the other stuff. Um, OK, the architecture itself is modular. So it's got a whole lot of helpers. Um, and these helpers are available as assists in the IDE that you can use at any time. So you can rename things. You, know, you can rename variables. It's fully scope aware. Um, it calculates your scopes. So if you've got variables shadowed, it'll only rename the variable that, you, that, that you're actually working with, not the shadowing. It's a way of getting rid of your shadowing. Um, if you have a call or a definition or a type, you can find the references to that and then go and make changes at, at all their sites if you need to. Um, I already mentioned you can, you can select a block of code, extract it into a function. It's an intelligent thing. If that block of code uses variables in context, it'll pass them as parameters. If, it, if the code be afterwards uses um, values that are calculated in that block, it'll come back as return values. Um, so yeah, that's the extract function. Inline function does the reverse. It takes a function, plugs it in. Also doing the simplest possible way so you can kind of see how it's called, and then you can clean it up as the next step. Um, variables extract an inline in a similar way, where just instead of making a function externally, it just earlier in the code makes a variable assignment. Um, you can find a definition of anything throughout the code base. Um, some, a lot of the time, you create a new function, you need to add it to an export. It's got a whole lot of intelligence about adding to an export. You can say create a new export, group it with some other set of, of exports. Um, and it all deals with the it deals with all the layout. You know, the you specify the refactorings at this abstract form level at the high level, but there's a close tie up to the raw original source code and a one to one mapping. So any change you make, it changes the underlying source code with comments, with layout, with uh, sorts out the indentation. Um, so you're not just kind of taking your beautiful code with comments and all the rest of it and turning it into some, some other thing when, when you manipulate it. You keep your original code. Um, you can delete functions. You can create a function if you need one. Repla the, the replace function is one of the sort of really powerful things here. We, the examples you saw earlier were, were kind of driven by that where you can specify that you replace a function just with a, with a bit of text, with a particular atom or, or, or value. Uh, you can choose one of its parameters. You can say, just shake up the order of the parameters. Um, yeah, there's a whole lot of options that you have there. It'll chase through the code, find the, find the, the instances of that call, and then replace it. Um, and oh, the other thing, equalizer is fully built in, so you can for any variable, you can query its type. It'll come back and say equalizer sees it as this type. Um, this has only just come available to us. We haven't actually made use of it inside ELP as a, to drive assists and refactors. We're very excited to be able to do that. Um, things like you know, case statement on a variable, and you just build out the, the, the possible options. Um, this, this we hope to be working on kind of as soon as we can and various other things. The key point is it's modular. It has this code intelligence. So you can, any neutral that gets integrated into it, you can immediately get. Um, you can 
ask for edoc comments, and you know, it, it has the, the standard Erlang compiler built in, so you get all the all the all those diagnostics as well. Um, so it's it's a, a kind of a Swiss Army knife of things that allow you to write your refactors. It manages the context of your input, and it generates the output that you need. And that's me. So that's where you can find the project. It's open source. You can download it now. You can uh, you can run it. It's got a, a, re a really early stage VS Code um, uh, extension, and there's Emac, Emac support via LSP mode. Other people must make new ones. You download an executable and get going on it. And questions. Questions? Hi, uh, this is a great talk. Do you, do you do anything about parse transforms? Ah. <laughs> At the moment, we don't. Um, and fundamentally, because it's developed internally and we have a policy around parse transforms, so it doesn't handle them. It doesn't have to handle them. There's no reason it can't handle them, um, but that'll have to be an open source contribution. Mm -hmm.